Minister. And we move on to questions to the Minister for Social Development. And could I inform the House? Order. Question 9 and question 11 have been, uh, have been withdrawn. And I call Mr Alec Maskey. Um, as at December 2013, the number of applicants on the housing waiting list for Greater West Belfast, which covers West Belfast and Lisburn Dairy Farm, Hoglass and Twinbrook, stands at 3,379 applicants. Waiting list demand is addressed through allocations, which include the reletting of existing social housing stock and the development of new social housing. The projected social housing need requirement for Greater West Belfast for the five-year period, that is 2013 to 18, has identified a requirement for 2,524 new social homes. In the current financial year 2013-14, the social housing new build programme includes 149 units, of which 23 units are for supported housing. To date, six schemes comprising 65 units have commenced. The new build programme for 2014-17 period plans to deliver a further 1,336 units, of which 47 units will be supported housing. In addition, the Housing Executive's Greater West Belfast strategy has identified the need to maximise housing supply within sustainable communities. However, the availability of development land in West Belfast remains in short supply. Housing associations have experienced difficulty in securing suitable development sites in the area. Also, a new uh, recent design and build competition in West Belfast resulted in new applications. The release of key sites between Hannestown Hill and Mona Bypass and the Bistian factory site will be important, therefore, in meeting this social housing demand. I would encourage the member to support the development of these key sites to ensure that housing demand in West Belfast area is met. Call Mr. Maskey for a supplement. That reply, and just to assure the minister that my party colleagues are very much in support of developing those additional uh, sites for social housing need in that particular uh, constituency. But can I ask the minister, given the, the figures that he has actually outlined himself, some of that those people in the wait list, but somewhere in the region of uh, 1,000 families, 300 senior citizens, 1,000 people uh, singles people living in hostels, uh, the, clearly the figures that the Minister has, has given to the House this afternoon will not meet the need, uh, in fact will fall considerably short of that need, given the fact that there is available land on either side of some of those what do we call peace lines. Has the minister, can the Minister give any assurance other than what he has already given today uh, to those people who are on the waiting list, many in waiting and housing stress, and some of them are homeless? Can the Minister give any assurance or any comfort to those individual families who are requiring homes who, on the basis of today's figures from the Minister, cannot look forward to being housed within the next number of years? Well, uh, the figures for, North, uh, for West Belfast are um, indeed uh, significant, but I would have to say, if you look right across the province, there are also significant waiting lists in other constituencies. Uh, in fact, not simply if you compare the figures for the number of people in housing stress, but also, in fact, if you look at some of the figures for uh, the period of time that people are on the waiting list before uh, the, they manage to get a house, um, the waiting time in a number of constituencies is actually not dissimilar to what it is in West Belfast. So I think it's important that we remember the whole issue across the whole province. Um, as regards West Belfast in particular, there I have identified the fact that um, there is an issue around the shortage of land, and certainly the Vistian site is a very substantial uh, site. Uh, it would accommodate um, quite a number of houses, uh, several hundred houses, uh, and therefore I think it's an important one, and I would hope uh, that people will support that. It would provide 196 new social homes, together with the opportunity for 48 families to own their own home. So that would indeed um, be very important, but it has unfortunately run into community and political opposition. Commissioner well, Alec Atwood. Touching upon the last uh, point, uh, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, it is very important that all appropriate land in West Belfast is developed for housing use, uh, given the stark figures uh, that you have outlined to the House this afternoon. 
and there is no reassurance to say that it's bad in West Belfast and it's bad everywhere else. That doesn't seem to me to be a very credible answer from the Minister. But do you not accept that there are certain sites that DETI have decided are significant economical, economic opportunities, that there are certain sites in West Belfast, and Vistian is one, and there will be sites in other constituencies where protection of industrial land in a very difficult situation around land use generally, that that principle may have to prevail in respect of the lands at Vistian? Um. I, I'm loath to get involved in what seems to be um, almost an inter-party dispute in West Belfast between the SDLP and um, Sinn Féin regarding the Vistian site. And what people sometimes say in private is different from what sometimes people say uh, in public. Um, I think it's important that the site is developed. Um, the member is absolutely right. Uh, I think that uh, housing development has to be seen, as I've always said, in the context not just of building houses, but building sustainable communities. And therefore, uh, we need to look at just not the provision of housing, but also the provision of recreational space, uh, employment opportunities, and so on. That's absolutely right. But there is a fact here that if people choose to live in that particular part of the city, there is a limit to the land that is currently available. If the member is aware of additional sites in West Belfast, um, you know, certainly um, I would be uh, willing to uh, advise the housing sector accordingly. Um, but I'm sure that over the past number of years before my coming into the department, uh, predecessors will also have identified to the housing executive sites in West Belfast uh, that might be appropriate. Before I call the next, I have to remind people that this is constituency specific, and you know, the Minister's notes for today may reflect that. But I call Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister uh, thus far? Can I ask the Minister if he could go into more detail? on what has been done to deliver suitable land for development. Um, thank the member for her question. Uh, delivering social housing is not without its challenges. Land available for development is limited, and also only 12 out of Northern Ireland's 25 housing associations are currently developing. And in addition to that, over the three-year period, 10-11 to 12-14, 70% of all new social housing was delivered by four housing associations, Apex, Clan Mill, Fold and Oakley. Um, to address a range of issues, including the land acquisition one, I have tasked my officials with ensuring that improved systems and processes are put in place to transfer housing executive surplus land and public sector surplus sites more efficiently to those housing associations which have proved that they can deliver. Uh, and officials are also reviewing the current system for social housing development and considering opening up the development of new social housing to other providers. Thank you. And I call Ms. Pam Cameron. Um, the Fuel Poverty Advisory Group was formed in 2005, and its primary task was to allow the private sector and voluntary groups to discuss fuel poverty issues and advise my department on progress uh, with its fuel poverty strategy. Following the publication of my department's new fuel poverty strategy, Warmer, Healthier Homes, which was in March 2011, the Fuel Poverty Action Advisory Group was succeeded by the Cross-Sectoral Partnership on Fuel Poverty. The Cross-Sectoral Partnership was established to ensure effective coordination of policies and actions to tackle fuel poverty. Membership of the group comprises senior officials from all the main departments that have a role in tackling poverty and representation from the voluntary and community sector and from the energy sector. In line with the recommendations from the Social Development Committee's Fuel Poverty Report of May 2012, the group divided into four thematic subgroups which have met regularly since, and those subgroups have developed action plans and have brought forward a range of initiatives to tackle fuel poverty. The composition of the subgroups provides a great wealth of knowledge on fuel poverty and a platform for sharing information across government, the energy companies and the voluntary sector. I chair the partnership and this group meets twice yearly and the next meeting is expected to take place in June uh, 2014. To help maintain a focus on fuel poverty issues, my officials are reviewing the structure of these subgroups to ensure that the fuel poverty strategy is supported fully uh, as we go forward. Cameron for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his um, answers thus far. Um,
Can I ask the Minister what is the rate and the figures pertaining to fuel poverty in South Antrim and what can be done to deal with these issues? Um, in the council areas of Newton Abbey and Antrim, which largely comprise South Antrim, um, the constituency of South Antrim, a total of 2,807 uh, energy efficiency improvement measures have been provided under warm homes since July 2009. Um, meanwhile, uh, measures available under the warm home scheme uh, include loft insulation, cavity wall insulation, hot water cylinder tanks, benefit entitlement checks, and energy efficiency advice. And I would certainly encourage anyone uh, who is a householder living in privately owned or privately rented accommodation and who is in receipt of a qualifying benefit to contact the Warm Home Scheme uh, to ascertain what measures they might be uh, entitled to. Um, the latest fuel poverty figures are from the 2011 um, House Condition Survey. Um, these uh, are that uh, across Northern Ireland, 42% of households are in fuel poverty. In some pockets, it goes up to um, 78%, but it does vary. Um, it's very hard to break it down into um, uh, constituencies, but uh, I will come back to the member with further information on that. Well, Mr. Michael Copeland. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, does the minister believe that he and his department, as well as his immediate pre predecessor, did all that they could to alleviate fuel poverty? including the establishment of this action group, which I welcome. And how does he account for the seemingly negligible impact that we have had? Well, th there are so many areas uh, of work that are undertaken whereby one can only speculate of how much worse the situation might have been if there had not been the interventions that have taken place. Uh, I believe that we've been very proactive uh, since coming into the department. Fuel poverty has been an issue that's been very much on my mind, um, and I put it very much to the fore uh, as regards the work that officials uh, take forward. Um, in terms of the warm home scheme, the boiler replacement scheme, double glazing, energy efficiency, uh, thermal insulation of housing executive properties, all of these things contribute uh, towards improving energy efficiency. However, we are very much dependent in Northern Ireland on oil as a main source uh, of fuel. Uh, we're very different from Great Britain, where there's a heavy reliance there upon gas, which is obviously cheaper. And that's why this is not something just for one department. Um, my colleague in Detty, uh, Arnie Foster, has been very proactive in terms of taking the gas network to the west of the province, because uh, that's an area where there's a particular need, and access to gas will make a big difference there. The other area of work that we've undertaken, which helps to some extent in this regard, is by our benefit uptake campaign, because that's putting more money into the pockets of more vulnerable people who therefore are able to afford the fuel that they need. And that's again the, those three areas energy efficiency of the home, the nature and cost of the fuel, and level of income. Those are the factors that determine whether a person is in fuel poverty or not. So Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And Minister, just following on there from your last answer. Would you ask the Fuel Poverty Action Group to investigate what alternative heat supply systems are available, especially in rural areas, in areas where there is no gas supply? Um, well, I, I certainly think that um, the member is a valid enough point that the, the more access there is to cheaper fuels, uh, the better. Um, I can remember actually meeting a group who were very keen that we should. Uh, ensure that there was provision made for the use of peat in uh, certain heating systems in, in the north of the province. There was a great enthusiasm for that in, in the Moyle area. Um, but I think that getting the, the um, gas network spread further across the province is crucial here. Having said that, the other thing I want just to, to mention there is that, uh, talking of rural areas, um, there has been a very good uh, uptake uh, on, in terms of our various measures that we have introduced, a very good uptake between rural and urban areas. Um, the, the focus of the work is right across the province, and it, or in rural areas uh, there has been a very significant take of the measures. So again, um, we, we do not forget the rural areas. It is a focus right across the province. Well, Mr. Phil Flanagan. I thank the Minister for his answers. One of the issues facing people that have no choice apart from home heat and oil 
um, isn't just the, the actual cost of the oil, but it's the, the difficulty that people have budgeting it, because you have to buy it in huge quantities to, to benefit from economies of scale. So, can the minister give us an update as to how um, he's trying to make oil more affordable for people that will never be able to switch to gas? Um, in terms of, of oil, um, we, we did have uh, some work that was taken forward on the base of the, the pay-as-you-go uh, scheme. However, um, it, it emerged subsequently that when economists looked at it, it wasn't as advantageous for, for the tenant as we thought. The mechanical system works, the, 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 the technology is there, but when you actually seek to implement it, you run into an issue regarding cost. Um, uh, that's why I've tasked officials to go back to uh, the two companies that were involved in that to see what can be done to try and make it a more attractive option. Um, but also, there are schemes, as the member will well know, where you have collective buying um, groups coming together, in particular areas up in Glen Ravel in uh, County Antrim, there was a group came together there. Uh, there are lots of different interventions, stamp schemes and other things to make oil more accessible to people. Um, but ultimately, I think that the, the move towards a range of um, fuels other than, than oil will be a particularly attractive one and, and beneficial to people. Michelle Michael Bean. Question three, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, firstly, I should clarify that my department is not transferring regeneration functions to councils, but will confer powers on them and transfer rele relevant budgets to enable councils to decide how best to take forward regeneration in their areas, having regard for the guidance that will be issued. The executive's vision for the new councils to be stronger, more efficient, and to be citizen-focused, responding to the needs, aspirations, and concerns of their communities is clear. Councils and their locally elected representatives are best placed to identify local needs, to make local plans and bring forward real improvements to the lives of the citizens within their communities, be they urban or rural. However, I am concerned that significant challenges lie ahead in ensuring that the transfer to the new arrangements is as smooth and seamless as possible. In order to assist the new councils in discharging their new responsibilities, I have tasked my officials to work closely with the statutory transition committees and later the shadow councils to assist them in putting in place effective arrangements to meet the needs of their communities. Additionally, I wrote to the uh, statutory transition committees on the 20th of February following a gateway health check of my department's preparedness and the progress of jointly developed implementation plans, offering to meet with STCs to discuss any concerns they may have about the challenges that we face over the next 14 months. It is hoped to hold those meetings in the coming weeks. So far, only two are planned, uh, with Mid-Ulster and Armagh, Banbridge and Craigavon. Uh, I hope that others will be arranged very quickly in the coming days and have dates confirmed with them as soon as possible. Michael Veen for a supplementary. Okay. Um, thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer, in which he refers to the Gateway Health Check. Could I ask the Minister to outline the outcome of that check? what he means by significant challenges, and if he has a plan of action to overcome these. Uh, the gateway review of my department's preparedness was largely positive and made some recommendations in relation to some internal improvements that my department could make in uh, relation to improved communications and the strengthening of some program management arrangements. Uh, my department has taken the health check findings on board and will make the necessary adjustments. It's important to remember that's looking at one end of the picture, the departmental end. There's also the other end of the picture, and that is, of course, at the council end. Um, as stated in the independent Gateway Health Check, the following challenges were referenced, demanding time skills, demanding environment of political and organizational change, and the fact that success in relation to continued delivery of the services the department currently provides to the most deprived communities relies very much on the active participation of councils in the run-up to the date of reorganization. To overcome these challenges, my department has implemented a series of measures with a view to achieving the high-level objective of transferring powers and functions by the 1st of April. My department recognizes that the new councils may be at varying degrees and stages of readiness in terms of taking forward their new operational responsibilities. And to mitigate that, my department will work closely with the new council chief executives to ensure a state of readiness for April 2015. Mr. Kieran McCarthy. 
Principal Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the Minister's response so far. Would the Minister agree that the new um, regeneration and indeed planning functions for councils should be accompanied by a requirement to be responsible for promoting shared space in all of public areas? Um, I'm sure that uh, the, the member uh, is uh, right there in saying that uh, most councils, I think, will want uh, to encourage uh, shared space. Um, particularly, a, a focus has to be there on uh, in urban regeneration. You're quite often thinking of town centres. And if town centres are to thrive, they need to be shared spaces. You can't sustain a town centre on having support for the shops and businesses and so on from simply one section of the community. Every section of the community needs to feel comfortable moving into those town centres. So I think that um, it's something there, and, and I discussed it in part the other week there in the debate around uh, the, uh, the pavement cafes and so on. Um, it, it's important that people have that aspiration, that commitment. It just makes good sense to do it. Uh, so I, I uh, would, would happily endorse what the member says. And I call Mr. Mervyn Story. Uh, question number four, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. The executive has committed to the reform of local government and has agreed a package of powers and functions that should, should transfer from central government to local government in 2015. As part of this, my department is extending powers to councils to enable them to address area-based regeneration. I believe that the reform of local government provides us all with a unique opportunity to bring about a step change in the delivery of area-based regeneration by placing the power, the resources and the decisions at the heart of local decision making. The Executive's vision for our new councils to be stronger, more efficient, citizens focused, responding to their needs, aspirations and the concerns of their communities, that's very clear. And so councils and their locally elected representatives are best placed to identify local needs, make local plans and bring forward real improvements to the lives of the citizens within their communities. Going forward, the Bala Money Master Plan will provide the council with a sound evidence base and guidance to help steer them in the right direction. But ultimately, decisions around the projects to take forward or set out in the master plan will rest with the new Causeway Coast and Glens Cluster Council, comprising Balamoney, Coleraine, Limon Valley and Moyle Councils. Well, Mr. Mervyn Story. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. And given the considerable capital that the, his own department has had in terms of the production of the master plan and, and I think the considerable buy-in that there has been by many, to many elements of the master plan. Could the minister give an assurance that given the concerns that he has raised in the previous answer to my <coughs> colleague Ms McIlveen when he made reference to effective arrangements being in place to ensure that these proposals are, are brought forward, will he give an assurance that his department having started the process in relation to the master plan will continue to work with the new council to ensure that its vision is brought into reality? Um, under the reform of um, local government, I will be bringing forward legislation that places a statutory duty in councils to have regard to the outcomes contained within the regeneration and community development framework. It will be a matter for councils ultimately to determine how they will exercise the powers and how they will deploy the resources. But my department will help support councils in taking on these new um, regeneration and community development responsibilities. I have written to the councils advising them that there should be a smooth transition to the new arrangements and to ensure there is the capacity for delivering regeneration and community development work, particularly regarding the staffing resources within the councils that will be required to deliver forward work plans. Um, an independent gateway health check that I mentioned involving interviews with DSD, DOE and local government stakeholders has examined arrangements in place for the department working in partnership with councils to implement RLG and a further review will be carried out in June 2014. So we're keeping a careful watch on the situation to make sure that things are moving properly in the right direction. And that review will provide an assessment of the adequacy of plans in place for the proposed transfer on the 1st of April 2015. 
The outcome of the check will identify potential obstacles to the transfer and any measures required to deal with these. I was out in Balamuni to see the launch of the master plan consultation. I was there again uh, to meet uh, the, the member and uh, local councillors in regard to the completion of the um, master plan consultation. It's a very exciting document. I think it holds out great possibilities and prospects for Balamuni. Um, and therefore, it's important that it is uh, something that is taken ahead in that smooth and seamless way to which I referred. I call Mr. Jim Allister. Uh, can I ask the Minister, in taking it forward, is it a situation where the Minister is saying to the new Council, here you are, here are our fine proposals and our master plan, now you take it and you pay for it? Or is the Minister uh, giving any undertaking of underwriting any of the funding of a scheme which he has begun? Well, I, I think if the member paid more attention to um, the communication between my department and the local council, he would be aware of the communication that has gone out to all of the councils, uh, setting out the financial commitment that there would be and the resources that would be passed over to the council to take forward this work in the same way as money will be passed over and resources to other councils to take forward the many schemes in those areas. So the uh, function moves across, the, the, the uh, lead role moves across to the council, and so do the resources uh, that would accompany that. And I call Ms. Karen McEvitt. Thank you, Mr. Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker. Question five. Um, the Housing Executive has advised me that following local surveys, they now estimate that there are 9,800 properties that require upgrading from single glazing or partial double glazing to full double glazing. They have further advised me that this figure does not include properties in recent double glazing schemes where the tenants have refused the work or properties in the stock transfer program which are not double glazed but have been removed from planned schemes. The housing executive has also advised that a total of 10,430 of their dwellings have now had double glazing installed since the commitment to have all, double, uh, all housing executive houses double glazed by March 2015, as agreed in the programme for government. Um. Call Ms. Karen McEvitt for yeah. a supplement. Thanks, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I was wondering, would the Minister give the House an update on the contracts for the refit of double glazing to um, the homes of approximately 11,000 uh, people that are currently waiting on the scheme to commence? Thank you. Um, the Housing Executive has advised me that the double glazing contracts have now been signed and they are now moving ahead to have double glazed windows installed in line with the programme target of completion by March 2015. The contracts have been awarded across the Housing Executive's three regional areas to the following contractors in Belfast PK Murphy Limited, in North uh, Dixon Contractors Limited and in, Belfast, uh, sorry, in South Ban Limited. Um, and, um, Work has already started in preparing for the actual installations because obviously there is preparatory work to be done for the schemes. I would expect work to be on site very, very quickly in a matter of weeks. Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Just to complete the picture, Minister, I wonder if you could tell us uh, what your assessment of the number of housing association houses that do not have double glazing and perhaps fill in the picture there about the number in transfer who also have double glazing at this point in time. Well, I think the, the, the member will appreciate that um, the housing association stock in general is, is much newer than the housing executive stock. There's a lot of older stock with the executive going back to the 60s, properties that were built even in some cases at the end of the 1950s and so on. So there's a, uh, they are houses from an earlier period when double glazing was not the standard. The housing association properties are much newer. In fact, they would be some of the most energy efficient properties that there are, and uh, we would certainly be encouraging housing associations to ensure that any of their properties that do not have double glazing uh, do install that as part of their programme of maintaining their stock. Every housing association is required uh, as part of uh, its regime to have a programme in place about upgrading maintenance of stock, and that should be part of that programme of work. Again, I call Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, question number six. Um, the Warm Home Scheme has been my department's primary tool in tackling fuel poverty since its inception in 2001. The scheme has been very popular and very successful, 
and has improved the energy efficiency of more than 120,000 low-income households. Uh, my department's fuel poverty strategy, Warmer, Healthier Homes, called for increased partnership working and improved targeting of resources to assist those households most at risk of fuel poverty. My department has been working with colleagues in the University of Ulster, the local councils and the housing executive on the development of a new evidence-based model for tackling fuel poverty. The results from the early pilots are impressive in terms of identifying and targeting those households most in need of assistance, and I'm encouraged by the progress. My department is consulting on proposals for a new affordable warm scheme until the 9th of May 2014, and the proposals contained within this consultation are evidence-based, and I believe they will provide a sound basis for targeting low-income households throughout Northern Ireland and making them warmer and healthier. In addition, as members are aware, the housing executive, in terms of energy efficiency, is working to ensure full double placing of their homes by March 2015, as set out in the uh, commitment that I made in the programme for government. Order, and that ends the period for oral questions, and we will now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. David McNary. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Recalling the Minister's high profile announcement that Northern Ireland Housing Executive contractors had overcharged by a staggering £18 million. What is the current position resulting from discussions between the NIHE and the contractors about which I'm sure the Minister has obviously been briefed on? Uh, the Member is absolutely right in saying that this is an issue between the Housing Executive and the contractors. Um, and they are in negotiation with those contractors at the moment. Um, I would hope that those negotiations are coming towards a conclusion, uh, that there's a mutually agreeable situation that emerges from that, uh, and it would be inappropriate, as I've said before, for me to comment until those discussions are completed. Um, it, it is something there that has a commercial dimension to it, obviously, uh, and a financial dimension on both sides, uh, and until they have completed their negotiations, and until this has been through the board of the housing executive, um, I couldn't possibly comment on that, but I would hope that they will be bringing something to the Board of the Housing Executive fairly soon. Nari for a supplementary. Um, I'm sorry to say I'm disappointed in the Minister who seems to me to have caught the common ailment of his ministerial colleagues, that, um, that one of uh, knowing more than they're going to tell us. Uh, perhaps he will return to the House and uh, make a statement to us when he, when he uh, finds it more appropriate. In the meantime, can he confirm to the House that the £18 million figure is a fictitious sum? And as a consequence, will he agree to redress the situation of the, the credit rating and other commercial damage that has been done to these uh, contractors and tell the House how he will set about doing that task uh, in, in the name of what is commercialism but what is right, Minister? Um, just so that the member is absolutely clear, as I think his supplementary betrayed maybe some confusion about the issue, um, the fact is this is a matter between the housing executive and the contractors. Um, it is a matter between the housing executive and the contractors. And there's an issue here about uh, where the role of the housing executive is and the housing executive board. This matter has not been to the board of the housing executive. And until it has been to the Board of the Housing Executive and they have had an opportunity to consider it and make their decision as to whether they are content, it would be totally wrong and inappropriate for me to comment on this matter. And the member can shake his head over there like a nodding dog as much as he wants. But the fact is, I want to show due respect to the Board of the Housing Executive, even if the member doesn't. Call Mr. Pat Sheehan. I've got a free last Concordia. Can the Minister explain how the recently refurbished houses in the Lower Old Park were allocated? Um, I, I welcome the member's interest in the affairs of a different constituency. Um, however, I'm very pleased to be able to tell him that I've already answered that question in response to a written question, which was that people uh, were allocated the houses uh, on the basis of them being on the housing executive waiting list. I had an opportunity recently to go down to see the houses. Uh, the first houses were uh, completed in uh, Mountview uh, Court. Uh, Mountview Street, I think, is the uh, next one. 
16 of the 26, I think, have been allocated. I had an opportunity to visit the houses. They are extremely well finished. I have to say that Clanmill have done an excellent job there. The tenants are very happy uh, with the houses that they have been allocated. And what was uh, a dire situation where people have been left li living in the middle of uh, desolation, dereliction and decay, uh, a situation that no one should be forced into. Um, those houses now are extremely well finished and there is a new enthusiasm and uh, urgency about the area, a new vitality. I uh, had an opportunity to visit the um, local community association at their AGM and speak to them about it. And I think that it's a great start. Uh, I look forward to the rest of the houses, the other uh, remainder of the 26 being completed, and also then to the housing sector's commitment to build, I think it's 12 houses, on an adjacent site on the front of the Old Park Road. Order. Now, the, the House has to hear the answers, please. Pat Sheehan for supplement. I got a few last concurrent going back a solution era, Aston Regression. Uh, unfortunately, didn't answer the question. But it's my understanding that some of these houses were allocated to people who were already in social housing locally. And I wonder, could the minister say uh, what level of points they had? And if several houses were allocated to people who had no points at all? My understanding is that only one case of a transfer that these were that were on the waiting list, and of course, people right across Northern Ireland are on the waiting list for a house, even though they may already be in a house. Just because you happen to be in a house doesn't bar you in any way from being on the waiting list. That's quite clear. I'm mean, surprised the member would even dream of asking the question. As regards people being allocated houses uh, on no points, uh, I'm totally unaware of that. I don't believe that to be the case. And the fact is, if the member wants to speak to the housing executive, he will maybe get a better understanding of the fact that there is housing need in North Belfast within the unionist community. Much as some people in the nationalist community want to deny it, it's there. In fact, as I pointed out previously, the waiting list in North Belfast constituency has more people from the unionist community on it than people from the nationalist community. And if the member even speaks about the length of time... Order. You see, some people just can't face up to facts. They prefer to perpetuate myths and imagine things. These are the facts. And would the member also maybe take on board, as he's so interested in another constituency, the fact that in parts of North Belfast, the time that you have to remain on the waiting list to get a house is actually longer in some of the unionist communities than it is in some of the nationalist communities. Mr. Tom Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister provide an update on the benefit of the boiler replacement schemes to the uh, home trade across Northern Ireland? On the 25th of May 2012, I announced the introduction of the £12 million boiler replacement scheme to improve energy efficiency in 16,000 homes across Northern Ireland. The scheme which is administered by the Northern Ireland Housing Executive is open to owner-occupiers whose household income is less than £40,000 per year with an inefficient boiler of at least 15 years. The grant of up to £1,000, depending on gross income, is available to assist in replacing an inefficient boiler for a more energy-efficient condensing oil or gas boiler. This includes switching from oil to gas or switching to a wood pellet burner uh, boiler as, as an option. The boiler replacement scheme was launched in September 2012 and has funding up to March 2015. It has been very successful and I was able to secure an additional £6 million of funding from the European Regional Development Fund and that will assist 8,000 additional owner-occupier households to replace their boiler over the final two years of the scheme, bringing the total homes that will be assisted to a total of 24,000. Domestic heating boilers account for around 60% of the household spend on energy bills. So an efficient boiler makes a significant difference to the annual energy bill. And in some cases where people were able to uh, achieve a saving of around a third uh, or even more in some cases, but a very substantial saving uh, in their fuel bill and has been a major uh, benefit therefore to some homes, particularly of people who are on lower incomes or more vulnerable. So I would encourage um, members to uh, engage with their constituents, keep them reminded of the scheme because the more people uh, who hear about it, the more people will benefit from it. Well, Mr. Buchanan for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for his response and can the Minister further advise of the level of employment 
that this is provided for the likes of individual installers uh, of these particular uh, boilers. Um, one of the great benefits of this particular scheme, and I think one of the things that we built into it purposely at the start was that the installation would be carried out by uh, installers at a very local level. Um, so um, plumbers working in a local area, getting work in that area. Uh, and when I went round to visit a number of homes where uh, installations had taken place, those who had carried out the installations uh, were very positive about it. They were saying, well, I may not have had a vast amount of work, but I've gained maybe 12 or 15 additional uh, jobs uh, for my small local business. Uh, through this, uh, the number obviously would have increased now. That was some time ago. But at the moment, we've got a, a figure of 1,800 separate installers have got installation work. And that figure of 1,800 shows how the work is being spread um, right across the province at the local level to local installers. And Ping, I want to point that another member raised earlier about rural urban. The rural urban split is 40% rural, 60% urban. And that's in line with the current warm homes target to assist rural areas. So a lot of workers getting work, a lot of installers getting work, uh, and significant number, 40% of them being in rural areas. I call Ms. Bronwyn McGahan. In Dungannon district, there's almost 1,000 people on the housing waiting list. And at the same time, figures from Latin Property Services show that there's 1,520 vacant domestic dwellings. So can I ask the Minister what is he doing to address this? Um, welcome indeed the question, because empty homes um, is an issue that I think is hugely important. Um, it, it, it's a wasted resource if a home is lying empty. And when I came into the department, it was clear that the issue of empty homes had been put very much on the back burner. Uh, we, we ran uh, a couple of pilots in two streets, both, uh, uh, one in uh, East Belfast, one in North Belfast, very different streets, but um, to get a sense of what the issues were, just to identify in a street where there were quite a number of empty properties, what were the reasons for them being empty properties? Uh, and that information has sped into uh, the renewed commitment now that there is to take forward work on empty homes. Um, the, the housing side really has to take the lead on this. Um, and I, I detect within the executive now much more uh, commitment to so doing. But you're right, it, it, the member is right, it is an opportunity that's uh, lost. A family could have a home, somebody could have additional income, uh, and it's a pity if that does not happen. Ms. McGahan for it. Sub. I thank the Minister for his response. Minister, your department has responsibility for town centre regeneration. So can I ask why your department is changing the usage of local businesses from commercial to domestic when there is so many vacant properties in Dungannon town? Yep. Um, we, we did have a very good scheme um, living over the shops. Um, that ran its course. It's been evaluated. And the intention is to bring forward in the not too distant future uh, a new scheme. Now, it will not be called living over the shops um, or lots as it was known. But certainly, it's a scheme which I think brings a new vibrancy to town centres. Um, there are many of our town centres that, quite frankly, are, are for a large part of the day dead. There, there, there's no one around, uh, there's no life there. If we have opportunities there, and we have a number, I was looking on Friday uh, from one part of uh, the, of Royal Avenue to another part, and just seeing there the number of uh, empty properties that there were. There are opportunities there for commercial properties that have three, four, five stories upstairs. Um, it's an additional income for the trader. It's an additional um, home that's provided. Um, and I think it's a good all-round success. Vibrancy on the street, more homes provided, and also more income to make a business which otherwise may not be sustainable or just be on the verge of sustainability, additionally sustainable. Thank you. Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what his current timeline is for the introduction of the under occupancy penalty uh, for social housing? Well, again, um, the, the Members' Party is represented on the Executive Subcommittee. Mr. Kennedy is the Minister that represents the Ulster Unionist Party on the Executive Subcommittee. And as the Member will be aware, obviously, from general conversation, general debate in this chamber, and also through um, the, the feedback that we've got, I'm sure, from his party colleague. Um, 
I am very concerned that we make sure that we have a package of measures for Northern Ireland that is fit for purpose. So therefore, welfare reform in Northern Ireland would be different from what it is across in Great Britain. Members are aware of a number of the flexibilities that were negotiated with uh, the United Kingdom government, in particular through Lord Floyd and Ian Duncan Smith, at a very early stage, uh, over a year ago, well over a year ago, and also the fact that there are proposals that we have brought together which would, I think, mitigate the worst effects uh, by far of um, the, the so-called uh, under-occupancy uh, tax or bedroom tax. Um, we have a, a situation in Northern Ireland where, uh, in the past, the uh, development of social housing, the social housing development programme, did not take account of the um, needs of welfare reform, uh, didn't take account of the need for more uh, smaller units, one and two uh, bedroom units. Uh, we were tending to build just simply larger three and four bed um, units. So uh, that's why when I came into the department, one of the things I did was say to the executive, when you're bringing forward the social housing development program, make sure in, you're in the, uh, taking account of uh, the, the potential impacts of the guards welfare reform. But the, the timeline for bringing forward the entire package uh, of measures is something that is uh, beyond my control. Uh, the uh, dangers of not moving forward in welfare reform in a way that is suitable for Northern Ireland and with a unique Northern Ireland uh, focus. Um, the, the danger of not moving ahead has been outlined very clearly by my uh, colleague in uh, DFP, Mr Hamilton, who has pointed out that if we simply sit as we are, £1 billion pounds will be lost uh, to the Northern Ireland block grant. In order that its time is ended for questions, the Minister, we must move on to questions. To